suffering as to which one of them go to heaven or hell. So th this is actually where I, you can start getting into some things that be, provide a good focus. We want to help suffering Christians. Evidently, the Shubat's idea there is that the church takes up the sword to do so. Now, I think it is perfectly right that the United States has begun, a little bit late, uh, providing food and water, for example, to the people in northern Iraq. And it was very enjoyable to watch a 500-pounder take out uh, an ISIS uh, uh, artillery piece. You know, uh, talk about precision precision bombing. The question is, and this is this is where we have a fundamental disagreement. Fundamental disagreement. The Shubats believe in Christian culture, Christian armies, and that this the church carries the sword and can wield the sword, not the sword of the spirit. Not, not spiritual discipline, but that the church has the right and, in fact, the duty to kill the heretic. Now, this is where even some of my Reformed brethren and I will part company, because I am a Reformed Baptist. And Baptists have a very long martyrology, even at the hands of Reformed people. I know that I would have been driven out of Geneva. Um... There is a Baptist drown in London in 1611. And as a result, I am very firmly committed to the belief that the church is not given the sword. I see nothing in the New Testament. Where, 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 where are the instructions? We are given instructions on how to take care of widows and how to do prayers and how to run the church and the preaching of the word and we are we are given all sorts of instruction along those lines where are we given instruction as to how we wage war how we choose our military leaders what we do with prisoners of war not there because none of the disciples none of the apostles and hence since we believe this is given by god the Spirit of God did not foresee any situation where the Christian church would be involved in doing such things. We see a fundamental difference between the theocracy of Israel, where you have a nation ordered, the officials provided for in the law of God, the tax system laid out in the law of God. That's what the tithes were. There wasn't just one tithe. There was the Maaser Sheni, the second tithe. There was the third tithe. There was the heave offerings. There was all sorts of ways of providing for the Levites and and, uh, and the house of Aaron and, and all the rest of that kind of stuff. You don't have any of that in the New Testament. You don't have any of that in, under the New Covenant. And every single time, every single time, the church has taken up the sword to exterminate heresy. She has brought tremendous disrepute upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tremendous disrepute. Now, I do believe that modern nations must indeed look to the law of God for guidance as to what is equity and justice and, and goodness. And uh, I'm going to be preaching through the, the Holiness Code at PRBC over the next number of months. And one of the first things we're going to see is the land spewed the inhabitants out that violated the fundamental moral tenets of God's law. And those, those elements of God's law are applicable to all people at all times. But there are all sorts of other things that were not applicable to all people at all times. And one of the great errors of Islam is that it, it has to force a particular cultural context upon every other culture. We have Acts chapter 15, so we don't have that. You don't have to make your statement of faith in biblical Greek, in Koine Greek or biblical Hebrew. But you do have to take the Shahada in Arabic. Why? Because they didn't have Acts 15, we did. And so the gospel can flourish in China, even as China has announced it's going to try to co-opt 
Christianity and come up with a Chinese version. Um, all of these, all these places, doesn't matter where in the world the gospel can go because it doesn't have to bring a particular culture with it. And as a Baptist, I am extremely concerned about religious freedom and religious freedom being removed by the power of the state. And I see that coming, our direction. No question about it. So, do I think it's appropriate later on he's going to talk about, you know, like, like Israel? I cannot see how anyone could argue that Israel does not have every possible right to defend herself against those who are sworn to her destruction, who will take monies that are given to them to build tunnels and to buy rockets and leave their people in utter poverty and then do this from population centers knowing purposefully that they'll bring about the death of their own people. They're despicable. Hamas is despicable. Have no problem with what Israel is doing. But Israel's not the church. In fact, I would argue Israel today isn't even the continuation of Israel of old by any stretch of the imagination. I disagree with a lot of people on that one. Israel's a nation and it has a right to its sovereign borders. It has a right to defend itself against people who would kill its citizens. That's basic morality. That's basic biblical morality. The problem here is the Shubats don't want to put forth the kind of effort to think through these things. Instead, you have this jumbled, confused idea. And later on, and I'm going to... Uh, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, there it, oh, there it is. He identified as slander. Yes, you slander. Here it is. And who is promoting aggressive Christian jihad? You slander. We promote Christian defensive wars. We promote Christian defensive wars. There's the Shabbats. We promote Christian defensive wars. So they believe that the church is to have the sword. Theodore said that it was appropriate for the church to wipe out the Cathars. And he used Old Testament paradigms to do that. Did not have any meaningful argumentation in regards to the New Covenant or anything like that. These men are not theologians by any stretch of the imagination. Not trained in that area at all. They make egregious errors when it comes to exegesis. Both of them. But... When you hear someone say, we promote Christian defensive wars, and these are people who are constantly denouncing Islam, you do know what the Muslims say about jihad, right? Jihad is always and only defensive. Has to be. All the classical scholars say the same thing. Jihad is always defensive. You can prove that from the Quran. Say, how, how can that be defensive? Look at what they're doing. I know. That's the point. You can call anything you want defensive. Everybody calls wars defensive. We promote Christian defensive wars. Once you take up the sword... The whole idea of offense and defense becomes a tactical decision on the battlefield. And every decent Muslim promoter of dawah will tell you the only proper context for jihad, and, and this is the very thin and scary line between the moderate and the radical is that that line is you have to have a caliph who will declare a state of jihad because the ummah is under attack by the infidel. Now, why then do we see ISIS engaged in clearly offensive war? Well, because they're evil and they could really care less about half this stuff anyways. But if they were to defend themselves, they would defend themselves as Osama bin Laden did in his writings by saying, 
Look at what the West has done to us. Look at the state of Islam in the world today. Look at what has happened in the colonization of historically Islamic nations by the West. We are under attack. Even what 2008, when I debated Jalal Abu al -Rub, what did he say during debate on the deity of Christ? Christianity invaded Iraq. So I find very little comfort, Mr. Shubat, in your saying, we don't promote aggressive Christian jihad, we promote Christian defensive wars, because that's exactly what the Muslims say too. So do forgive me for not finding that to be overly impressive. Overly impressive. Really not much there. Um, so uh, I'm skipping over the fact that, once again, um, Mr. Shubat proved himself utterly without honor by doing the let's search the web, dig everything we can out of every website to throw mud at James White stuff, including personal family stuff, about which he's utterly ignorant and a liar, and throw it on the web. Both of the articles, uh, the series of articles, both authors that I'll be addressing today, did the same thing. When you start going there, you demonstrate that you not only have no honor, no integrity, uh, but you also have no argument. If you had a meaningful argument, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Skipping over that, he says, would Mr. White dare accuse Israel of carrying arms and fighting or the U.S. bombing uh, Dresden, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, misspelled Nagasaki, uh, as wrong? Um, I have some questions about what happened to Dresden. If you've studied it, you should too. Hiroshima, and actually it was Urakami. I know everybody says Nagasaki, but if you've actually studied the bombing at all, um, due to cloud cover, uh, Nagasaki as a whole was primarily spared. It was Urakami that bore the brunt. And I didn't know until just recently that the Hiroshima bomb was basically a dud. Only about a third of it exploded. Uh, the Nagasaki bomb was much stronger. Um, were those wrong? I do not believe they were. I do not believe that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were wrong. Dresden, I question. Um, the necessity of it. Given the point in the war, its military objections, uh, objectives, so on and so forth. I question Dresden. Hiroshima and Nagasaki, no. Why? Number of things. What Japan had been doing for more than a decade, most of us don't know anything about. Unfortunately, most of us in the West pretty much only know about World War II. Well, if jaywalking tells me anything, and most of the people in the West don't know anything about today, let alone then. But if you have a serious interest in what happened during World War II, most Americans' interest starts at the earliest 1939 and much more after December 7, 1941, obviously. The war atrocities of Japan have yet to truly be addressed. I was not aware until just recently that there remains a very strong, that many of the worst offenders lived long lives and have only recently died in Japan. In fact, many were, were lionized and rewarded. And only a small handful in comparison to Germany were actually punished. What most people don't realize, and this is just a a historical aside here at the moment, just because some of us actually think seriously about these things and don't just use these things as baseball bats in really bad internet articles. In seven weeks, in 1930, well, 1937, beginning of 1938, the Japanese army, in the taking of Nanking, killed more innocent civilians in seven weeks for no reason in the most horrific and torturous ways that all who died in both atomic bombings put together. 
Most people don't know that. The rape of Nanking is one of the most gut-wrenching demonstrations of total depravity that will ever be known in the modern world. Well, okay, sorry. <laughs> that is currently known in the modern world. Uh, and I know, I know the, the murders of millions under Stalin. I know, just as horrible. But the glee, the depravity that the Japanese soldier showed in the destruction of Nanking. Just amazing. I, I, I can't go into it on the program, but the documentation's there. More civilians in seven weeks than in both together, combined, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or Urikami. And it is well known that Japan was preparing for a to the last person defense of the home islands. They were keeping their best fighter planes in reserve. They were literally producing guns that could only be fired about three times to be given to their their uh, citizens, but to be used on, on American soldiers after they walked by. I mean, conservatively, a million U.S. soldiers would have died in the invasion of Japan, conservatively a million not including the Japanese losses. And so, yes, I do believe that it was proper to do what they did at that time and that it saved human life. Dresden, like I said, I don't think was necessary. I think there was, uh, there was some, there was a problem there. None of this has anything to do with the fact that it was not the Christian church that made those decisions. It was a nation The church is not given atomic bombs, thank God. The church is not given the sword to do these things. Then he goes on to say, have the anti-crusaders ever wondered why the liberal, the Muslim, and the Calvinists are all anti-crusaders? So what does that mean? The Shubats are pro-crusaders. Now, I've taught church history a number of times, which neither of these gentlemen have. And unlike them, I don't use church history as a baseball bat. When I talk about the Crusades, I talk about the effect they had upon Europe. I talk about the theology out of which they were born. I talk about the fact they were primarily military things. They demonstrate the problems of sacralism. Uh, the Muslims at the time did not see it the way modern Muslims see it, by the way. And I talk about the provocations that the Muslims themselves had uh, had engaged in that brought these things about. but. They are primarily military things. And I do, of course, then recognize that Rome's role theologically in the Crusades is extremely problematic because it's a violation of biblical norms. And, of course, the granting of indulgences and everything else directly addresses the gospel. But these guys are pro-Crusaders. He says, while it is true that the Crusaders did err the bulk of their efforts were justified. Ever wonder how fast we can turn a Calvinist into a liberal and even pro-Muslim? It takes five minutes to spring up the Crusaders and enjoy the Sophism. Direct quote. Then in responding to the article, the um, video that I posted, he tries to soften his position. No, I didn't try to soften my position. I was explaining my position. If you had read any of my books, you would have known this was my position all along, and therefore it wasn't softening anything. But I wouldn't expect you to do that. He tries to soften his position by saying that, quote, Catholics can be saved despite being Catholic, but such is an oxymoron example and is an attempt of a sophist, Mr. White. No. You're not saved by the name of the church into which you walk on Sunday morning. Sadly, there will be people who have listened to the gospel explained with tremendous clarity in the pews of the Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church that will not be in heaven. That's not what makes you a Christian. And by the grace of God, there are simple, believing folks, maybe because of where they live, maybe because of other issues in their life that 
go to Roman Catholic Church, but they're not believing the gospel according to Rome. I've always said that. You can go back as far as you want to go, and you will find me saying that. Your ignorance of my 40-some-odd debates with Roman Catholics and books on the subject notwithstanding, Mr. Schubert, I've always said that. I wasn't softening my position, and it's very consistent, isn't it? Yeah, it's very consistent. Not that you'll represent it accurately, because I don't know that that's something you're concerned about doing. And when did we ever teach that one is saved by purely good works, but that works are the evidence of true faith? This is why the solas are so important. I didn't say that you had said that you're saved purely by good works. Rome is semi-Pelagian. The point, of course, is always has been, and everyone who's known this ministry for any amount of time knows that this is something I have said until it's a broken record. The issue of the Reformation was not the necessity of grace. The issue of the Reformation was the sufficiency of grace. How many times have I said that? Thousands. Thousands of times. Then Mr. White scrambles to find a response Oh, yeah, I've never thought of any of these things before. I mean, wow, Wally Chubot has just thrown stuff at me. I've never thought of before. No Roman Catholic apologist I've ever debated has ever made me think about stuff like this. Mr. White scrambles to find a response by saying that how one sacrifices themselves to die for others as meaningless. By that he makes Christ's own words invalid. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Obviously, the context of Jesus' words is his own giving of his life for his disciples, his friends, and that it is his self-giving that provides the way of salvation. Uh, If you want to turn that into a martyrology that says that if you give your life for someone else, that somehow will save you, then just be straightforward and say that and say that we don't need the cross. All you've got to do is die for your own sins. Just be straightforward. But every rational person knows that what I was saying is that there are men from every religion who have given themselves for others. And that does not wash away your sins. Never can wash away your sins. Never will wash away your sins. 